Hi, I'm Ed Sperling. I'm the Editor-in-Chief of Semiconductor Engineering. I'm over at Rambus with Craig Hampel, who's going to talk today about what's next in computing, how we really accelerate the speed, the throughput, the latency inside of the most advanced computing systems that we have today. Craig, we've been following Moore's Law for the past 54 years. We've been very effective at shrinking things down to 7 nanometers, 5 nanometers, even going to 3 nanometers. We've solved that technically, but we're not getting the same kind of advances in performance that we got in the past. What's the next step? How do we ratchet this up? It's a great question. Um, I think I, I like to look at the big picture. Um, and if you actually, Moore's Law is part of a much larger trend. If you consider the, the long thread of humanity back to mechanical computers and even math tables and even the human intellectual capacity to produce a math operation. Um, it's actually been on an exponential for some time and Moore's Law is the most recent satisfaction of that need for high capacity compute. And that need's going to continue. I think it's evident there's so many businesses and, and, and business models that are built around the necessity for cost effective high density compute that even after Moore's Laws ends, there's going to be something that replaces it. Um, so that's what we're really looking at here at Rambus, is what are the kind of future technologies that enable um, an extension of that high density compute model to sustain those um, more general business models? Why don't you draw this out for us? Oh, sure. Um, you know, Moore's Law is often driven, drawn as an exponential. I mean, it is an exponential, um, doubling every two years to 18 months the compute density of a device. Um, but that sits on a, a much bigger curve, which is how much math or how much how many computational operations can does humanity do? Um, and so we have the, the per device curve, but we also have way more compute, compute entities, more chips in the world performing computation than we've ever had before. Uh, modern, data, modern data centers use them very efficiently, so our utilization of that computation is high as well. But if you look at this at the kind of at the big picture, it's the need for computation. But if you look at the, the smaller picture, it's often a notion of these technologies take a little time to adopt and there's a, a tech, and then they grow in this exponential and then our ability to scale them slows. It's often called an S-curve. Um, this bigger picture curve is made up of a sequence of these, these S-curves where one technology um, enters and then is getting replaced by a new technology. And Moore's Law has been, um, and, and semi CMOS semiconductors have been a compelling um, portion of this curve. But I think it's evident that it's some of its scaling characteristics with respect to energy proportionality and cost for f per flop are, are, not, are going to slow. So what we're really interested in is, is what are some of the exciting things that might be this next S curve? And that's the area that's most interesting to us. And that next step, what does that have to be? Are we talking 10x or are we talking 100x? Uh, you know, Moore's Law is not going to end abruptly, so even this S-curve has a slope to it. So, um, you know, to be, to be better, it has to be on, on, on Moore's, Moore's Law initially, you know, which is a 2 to 5x. But it also needs sustainability. So, um, you know, we need to look at technologies that can, um, in theory, provide hundreds of times or two orders of magnitude or even more in long-term um, compute density to really be viable as a long-term trend and to really solve this, this need. And so we're seeing some of this in terms of some of the architectures that are coming out there. The neural networks that are starting to show up are one approach to solving this problem, right? But what you're talking about here is literally in the hardware. This has to be improved. Uh, yeah, I think there's certainly um, two, two approaches, at least two approaches to this curve. There's specialization. A neural network is going to be very, very good at, at learning and matching to an algorithm, at matching. Um, it's going to be very good at those things. But to extend the more general purpose compute, um, we think we need solutions that really look like, from a processing standpoint and a programming standpoint, like um, today's x86 processors. So how do we get there? Uh, here at Rambus, we're looking at, um, really at looking at changing the operating environment of the, of the computer. Uh, with data centers being as centralized and as big a part of the businesses of these, these large conglomerates, um, we think we can take advantage of that by changing the operating environment. Um, basically by taking advantage of some of the properties of cooled CMOS and also new materials um, that superconduct potentially to build data centers that are much more energy efficient by taking advantage of cryogenics. And part of what's happened here is that computing has now shifted to a lot of the, particularly with machine learning and, and AI and 
deep learning, a lot of the training has to be done in places where you don't necessarily have to interact with it regularly, right? Yeah, I think a lot of uh, computation is now being able to run, be run as both batch processing and in a centralized data center. Um, you know, the, the, the centralization of compute um, in hyperscale and in the data center in general um, has, has, has enabled that. I mean, machine learning, the learning portion of machine learning, uh, will we'll, we'll use that same infrastructure. And how about going out into the edge, which is where a lot of the data is coming in? An, an, an absolutely important. Um, the second trend that we're seeing is um, the client server, server model being driven by mobile devices and by the IoT. And those IoT devices and, and mobile devices obviously have to be fielded. Uh, so the, one of the motivations of edge compute is to move more of that local computation uh, closer to that mobile device. Latency to the data center for a lot of applications is going to become more important. Um, things like tr voice translation, um, language translation, uh, latency is really important. So uh, we think that there's a need to move this high density compute closer to the edge. And making it dense so that you can, you can quickly deploy a lot of data um, near those mobile devices, that's the notion of the edge, um, is very consistent with the use of cryogenics. And so as we start getting more data, and as we start improving every step of this from the uh, data center to the edge, to the compute architecture that's there, to the network itself, do all those pieces add up collectively to a massive improvement? Uh, great question. Uh, no one innovation facilitates that massive improvement. Um, you know, the, the, this is a big industry and there's a lot of potential bottlenecks. Um, you know, the modern computation is kind of a game of whack-a-mole, if you will. Um, when you solve one problem, another one becomes the bottleneck. Uh, so I think we have to, certainly increasing the compute density solves a lot of problems because inter interconnects get smaller um, and the amount of compute in a physical space gets smaller, so deployment co costs go down. So that is a good first step, but we're also going to need um, better uh, northwest traffic in the, in the data center. Um, we're probably going to see optics uh, more prevalent in, into machine-to-machine -machine or rack-to-rack um, communications. So there's a, a whole number, a whole host of technologies that, that need to enable this kind of um, advantage. One of the solutions is to change the dynamics here in, in a, some very fundamental ways. So, of course, you have quantum computing uh, that's been developed and, and still working on and probably will show up in the market in, what, 10 years or so on a, on a regular basis. But you also have other things that ha are being tested right now that have never really been effectively used, cryogenic computing, for example. What does that do to this picture? Um, it's kind of a spectrum of solutions, and I think that's also important because it's not unlikely that a new data center is, um, happens totally organically and is entirely new. So we're looking at ways that existing CMOS solutions can take advantage of lower operating temperature um, by reducing leakage and running voltages lower, which were some of the properties that enabled Moore's Law. So I think the first thing you'll see is um, using conventional CMOS, even in our case, conventional DRAM, um, in these colder operating temperatures. To get those advantages, you don't have to go all the way down to superconductors. Um, most of our work's at 77 Kelvin today, which is certainly cold, but it's not an expensive cold, if you will. Uh, after that, you'll see, you know, there's a, a threshold under which you see a number of materials start to superconduct. Uh, and that's when you get probably the most significant discontinuity and conventional computing, when you start using superconductors to both um, produce the gate and to do the communication within the machine. Uh, so that next threshold is, is say, sub 8 Kelvin or so. As you start getting down to these uh, very, very cold temperatures, what does that do and where, how does that fit in with, for example, optics and, and using light? Uh, optics are very attractive for long haul and, and they're very energy efficient and it's obviously it's a very fast form of transportation, of communication. But um, if you're going to be operating on, on electrons um, at the computational level, the conversion overhead's high. So we think that cryogenics lets you maintain really high performance, really high energy proportionality, energy efficiency, um, without having to use optics um, within the cryogenic domain. Where will we see this? Is it going to be in normal data centers? Is it going to be in, in very remote locations that nobody's ever been to? Uh, certainly, initial deployments will be will be specialized in data centers that are that are amenable to functions that really take advantage of this. Um, longer term, uh, we we anticipate it being deployed more broadly, um, and you know there's a possibility that you know anything any remote compute is uses cryogenics um, in the not too distant future. Computing has always been about solving bottlenecks. Where do you see the problems now? Energy scaling is the big problem, and that's the bottleneck that really energy 
both Moore's law and Denard scaling in the case of DRAM had an energy component to them. Uh, so get, getting the energy efficiency from these new materials uh, is in, is is um, a, a critical bottleneck, especially because you're going to pay for some cooling costs. So um, you have to get a significant advantage to overcome that cooling cost. Uh, after that, um, a number of things quickly get a lot easier. Uh, as you can make compute denser, more dense, uh, and, and get closer proximity between memory and compute and even storage, um, and compute to compute, now you can do more work with less transport. And, and distance um, is kind of the en en enemy of energy efficiency. Uh, you get both loss um, and you get less, less efficiency because of some of the technologies you have to use to overcome uh, lossy wires. So it gets easier actually for a while. Uh, after that, um, the, the new technologies and new invention needs to do to continue that scaling. So are we actually scaling the physical transistors or are we scaling the density at which they're packed together? Well, um, good question. I think the need is to get more compute in a smaller space. Uh, and, you can do, and since you're thermally limited, uh, you have to have both an energy efficient transistor and a small transistor. Uh, so I don't think initially you'll see these superconducting, superconducting technologies drive new geometries, but long term they may because they can um, operate at much lower, lower voltages. What does this actually mean to DRAM? Um, well, certainly DRAM, D DRAM is, is, a, is a high value, um, really high contributor to these data centers. Uh, so it's important to consider um, that high, high bandwidth, low latency co compute. Our early work says that um, to get DRAM to work at 77 Kelvin, it quickly has some really attractive properties. So it's, it's very functional. But as I mentioned earlier, the next big effort needs to be to drive that power down. So take advantage of these, the, the properties of DRAM at low temperature that make it more energy efficient and potentially even make it, allow it to scale for a little bit longer. Um, so I think it means, it means that DRAM works, but to get it to work effectively and optimize for these new environments um, is where the next phase, phase starts. So for anybody that's thinking that Moore's Law is over and scaling's over and we're, we've hit a wall, you're saying, no, we have a long way to go. Um, certainly there's some technologies that if they pan out the way we hope they, they, they do, we're going to continue to see some evolution. Um, and, and certainly memory scaling and compute scaling can continue. Craig Hampel, thanks for a very interesting conversation. Thank you.